Kamal Dabusi is working with uh, communities addressing disadvantage with asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants. He is the CEO of Western Sydney MRC and has held numerous positions in community legal services, youth services, and ethnic organizations. He's been working with Save the Children for over two years, trying to bring home his daughter and grandchildren who has been abandoned amongst the 20 Australian adults and 47 children in Syrian-based camps, Al Roche and Al Hol. Interacting with law enforcement and government agencies in Australia, he was told that keeping quiet would be in their best interest. That has achieved nothing. Later this year, he tells his story in his first book, A Father's Plea. My daughter, Mariam, her husband and her baby daughter went overseas in 2015 to Lebanon and Turkey in what was supposed to be their first overseas holiday. They have not been home since. After months of not knowing where she was, I was informed by the Australian government that Mariam had been coerced into going into Syria, into the clutches of Islamic State. Much later, I would learn from Mariam that she had been forced by gunpoint by her husband after being tricked into going to the Syrian border. Marion's husband was killed around the same time my second grandchild was born. She tried to leave, she was caught, jailed, and forced to marry another IS fighter. She soon fell pregnant, and then she was trapped. When he was killed, she was forced to marry another IS fighter. Since the fall of IS in 2017, Mariam and my three beautiful tiny grandchildren have been classed as foreign fighters, left to language in refugee camps with around 60 other Australians on the Syrian border. When Mariam turned 29, she begged me, Dad, I don't want to be here on my next birthday. Today, as we film, it's Mariam's 30th birthday, and we're no closer to getting her home. I've been told that by keeping a low profile, that would be the best chance of being reunited with my family. That has achieved nothing. This is our story. I believe I have the right time zone. I'm speaking to you from Sydney, Australia. I'm, uh, I'm uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person uh, due to restrictions in this COVID environment that we are in. It's very difficult to leave Australia as it's difficult to enter Australia. Can I thank the organizers, Repatriation of the Children Denmark for giving me the opportunity to speak. Can I also thank and acknowledge all the fellow speakers on the panel today. It's a very impressive list of speakers, and I'm very humbled to be able to speak to you and to speak alongside them today. Before I continue, I'd like to provide a traditional, traditional greeting to the original inhabitants of the land of which I'm speaking on today, the Capricorn people of the Darug Nation, the indigenous or Aboriginal people of the land on who we sit with today. Um, it's important to note the original owners of the land and note that Australia is the only former Commonwealth country that doesn't have a treaty with its indigenous populations and someone who I stand with shoulder and shoulder for the path of true and, la true and lasting reconciliation. I've um, been asked to speak to you today um, as I am a father of a daughter that was suffered at uh, the hands of IS. She was trafficked into Syria by her husband and she has been there since 2015. She's been in a Kurdish camp since February 2019. Um, in an attempt to try and get back to Australia on her second escape attempt, she was stopped by the Kurds before the fall of Belarus, and she was placed in a whole refugee camp. Um, my story starts in 2015, when I had a knock at the door by the Australian government 
in which the Australian government told me that my daughter was coerced into going into Syria. It wasn't until August 2019, some four years later, that I found out the awful truth that, in fact, she had been forced at gunpoint by her husband into going to Syria after being going tricked to the border. But if I go back four years earlier, when I had that knock at the door, it started me on a journey on which trying to piece what had happened, what had taken place, the information, the heartbreak, the journey has been an absolute nightmare. I have in those four years tried to piece together what's happened. I have had scrambled messages, incomplete messages. I have asked information as to where she was. I was told that stop asking dad, you won't, I won't be able to speak to you if you keep asking me these questions. I did not know that her phone was being monitored so closely. I did not know that all the messages that I was receiving actually weren't from her precisely, but uh, it's been a journey all the same. For those that don't know my story, my daughter was taken to Syria. She, her husband forced her to go when she was pregnant, before the birth of her second child, he was killed. After she gave birth to her second child, she, uh, she tried to leave, she was caught, she was jailed. She was given the option of staying in jail and loss of her children or marrying a second IS fighter. Obviously, she chose to keep her children with her and she married again. We have a third grandchild as a result of that marriage, whom we love dearly. But then he died and she again was forced into a third marriage. So she was trafficked from person to person in horrendous circumstances. During that time, I had spent a 17 month period not knowing whether she was alive or dead. And 17 months not knowing whether your child is alive or dead is a terrible thing to go through. Before she'd made contact with me, I'd started grief counselling, believing that my child had died. And uh, I was dealing with that inevitability, with that possibility when I had this miracle of a phone call of a message come through saying, urgent, urgent dad, I need to speak to you, I'm here. You would have seen some of the video a bit earlier um, of my journey, it gives it a summary. It's a 90 second video, but it contains a lot of information. Um, what I'm trying to do now is to fill in a little bit more of that so you're aware as to what my journey is and what my story is. It's not easy being a father of a child caught up in those circumstances, of having a, a, almost a secret that you had to carry around because the government's told you not to share it, not to speak to anyone about it. Um, you're trying to pick up those pieces and get that information, trying to live a normal life. You have to put food on the table, pay the mortgage, pay the bills, and uh, and to continue in this nightmare that I've been marrying, I've been carrying since 2015. My daughter arrived into Turkey and she said something was wrong. She tried to make contact with her mother to buy tickets to come out. Um, she tried to arrange it. Her husband realized that and spun a story and kept her in Turkey longer and uh, then tricked her down to the border on the pretext that they were managing to get somebody out of IS territory. And it was actually at the border at gunpoint that he not only took my daughter across, he took his own mother and father and younger brother. So his whole family he managed to take across under gunshots and fire. Um, in this time, I've talked to the Australian government at length. I've tried to work out how we can try and bring her back. Unfortunately, the Australian government was only interested in that point in time with information and intelligence. Um, they didn't actually share any opportunity or mechanism which I could bring her back. Uh, they, uh, they insisted on me providing them with as much information as possible, but no option or opportunity. The only thing they ever told me was that if she can find her way to a Kurdish camp, that this would be a way for her to come back to Australia. Well, it's been two and a half years that she's been in a camp and two and a half years that we've been asking the Australian government to bring her home, her and the other women and children in the camp, and it's to date no action has been taken. When my daughter found herself in the camp in February 2019, she then was shifted in again in April 2019 to be with the other Australians that were in the camp. And it was actually at that point that my daughter realised that together they could do more than being apart. 
And my daughter encouraged the other women in the camp to make contact with their families in Australia, and they in turn contacted me. And we organised a family group, and we have an organised, advocated family support group, of which I'm the face of. And we've been working with the Australian government to try and get them to take action together. Um, and as a part of that advocacy, we have managed to then speak publicly also in the media. And whilst we still don't have traction on bringing them back to Australia, the topic is part of the mainstream discourse. There is actually uh, an open dialogue. It's brought up in the Senate estimates meeting parliamentary process. It's talked about in the media. I have a public face to this particular exercise. So uh, whilst we don't have them home, it's not a taboo subject. It's not a subject that's difficult to talk about, but we are organised and we are speaking about this. In our journey, and I'm going to share some information with you in a little bit about the public work that we've been doing, but in this journey, um, we have had three very clear objectives. Um, number one, we need to get them home. And this still hasn't happened, but we need to get these women and children home. Number two, we need to make sure that they are protected, they're managed, they're supported whilst they're there. And before they come home, we need to somehow make sure they survive the time that they are there because they are facing risks every day and they're facing risks from the other extremists in the camp that you're aware about. They're facing risks from health and disease issues. They're facing risks from a whole multitude of issues and we need to make sure that they are somehow protected before they return and that they are managing to return. And lastly, we are also, a um, uh, uh, third objective is that we protect them because we do know that once they do make it home and whilst they are there, they are the subject of media scrutiny. They're the subject of academic inquiry. They're going to be the subject of security forces. Um, and so the third objective is to protect them. So it's under those three objectives that we've organised a family unit. And our bottom line as families and our bottom line for them as mothers is that we do not want the children separated from their mothers at all. And to us, this is a underscoring issue. Um, thankfully, the Australian government have never said to us that they're intending to separate the children from their mothers. They've recognised their international obligations of the rights of the child and that these children are entitled to remain with their mothers. And they have told us that when they do decide to move, that they will repatriate the children alongside their mothers as well. So there's no intention on behalf of the Australian government to separate the children from their mothers. And to that point, we're very thankful and we think our advocacy has gone away to make that happen. For those that aren't aware, the Australian government's official position is that these women and children will be coming home. The question is when, when it is safe to do so. When it is, when, and, and at the moment, their primary objective them coming home is that Syria is not a safe environment for them to conduct repatriations. And it's under this environment that we are operating and we would suggest to the Australian government that this is a false issue, that they can be brought home and they should be brought home. It is safe to do so. Um, to that end, there has been uh, uh, various bits of media that's come about. So this is a quote from the ABC Four Corners program that aired in September 2019. And in September 2019, the ABC, which is the national broadcaster, this is the prime current affairs program nationwide. Mariam said on this program, I'm finished, I am done, I'm broken. I've been through so much, I can't anymore. I'm a nervous wreck, I need my dad. To any parent that's in the audience, to hear their daughter or their child say such a thing is emotionally heart-wrenching. And to have her there in front of me and to hold her in my arms and not being able to bring her home feels criminal in my eyes. It's a very difficult exercise to be. What I'd also like to share is this graphic here, explaining that my daughter was a subject of a sophisticated trafficking operation. She was trafficked into Syria. Whilst she went at gunpoint, the stories of so many people were the same. We are talking about 67 women and children, 20 mothers and 47 children. The majority of children under the age of six were born there and uh, and they are, they are not listed in this graphic. But you could see at the top of the tree, Mohammed Dahab, which was my son-in-law's brother, a very senior member in IS, and he's managed to traffic all those people below that. His brother lifted, listed 
Um, there you'll see Khaled Dahab listed, and below that is uh, my daughter, Mariam Tabusi. But all these other people were trafficked as a result of this man. The majority of Australians actually are connected, that are still alive, are connected through this person here. And that's, that's a really important um, uh, uh, distinction to make. The, uh, these people have been trafficked and they remain the risk of re-trafficking. The children, I have three grandchildren. One is born in Australia with Australian documentation. There are two more that are born in Syria that are without documentation and they run a particular high risk. They're extra, they are even more vulnerable because they don't have documentation and they are at risk of exploitation, of trafficking, of slavery, of sexual abuse, and, and, uh, and uh, this danger is ever present and requires protection of their host country. And Australia since has, has, has not yet taken that action. I would also like, if I can, to show you uh, the first few minutes of a, the ABC Four Corners interview in which my daughter spoke on the national broadcaster. She was very brave and uh, she undertook this action and I would like to share with you uh, approximately a, a minute, a minute and a half of this presentation if I can. My name is Mariam Sabudabusi. I have three children. My name is Aisha, Khalid, Khalid and Fatima. I'd like the Australian government to know that we're actually broken. I mean, we're shattered. We are broken people. So, how did you end up here? A long story short, basically I was tricked into coming to Syria with my, by my husband. How did that happen? It started off as a normal holiday. Um, my husband actually never had ne my husband had never left the country at the time, so it was the first time he had agreed to take me overseas. So we had a really nice holiday planned. We went uh, to Malaysia, took me to Dubai, we went to Lebanon. So um, the links for that presentation um, can be made available and you can see that online at a later stage. Um, if uh, 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 for those that were interested in seeing the, uh, the, uh, the presentation with the Four Corners program. Um, and Mariam was very, very courageous. She lifted the niqab off her face in a whole camp and she spoke to the Australian public directly without the face covering. Result of that interview, of course, she faced death threats. The Australian women had to hide her. She had to go from tent to tent at nights. The women had to put 24 hour guard on the camp and still there was no reaction from the Australian government. It was a very horrendous exercise. Um, in Father's Day 2020 last year, they were moved from Al Hal to Al Raj camp. And for everyone who knows, Al Hal camp has uh, 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 less security, more phones, but it's much more dangerous. The offset was whilst Al Raj was more securitized, we do not have the same access and communication what we had when we had at Al Hal. So that's one of the, the trade offs. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to jump, if I can, to the, the issue about trying to bring the Australian women and children home. Um, there have been numerous offers by, um, by uh, international, by the Kurds themselves, by the United States to bring the Australian women and children home. And uh, I, I'm going to go to the interview with Nathan Sales um, in 2019 in which she made a direct approach to the Australian government through the ABC again, the national broadcaster, in respect to the women and children that are in the camp. Um, and I hope that this shows properly on your screen. 
And what's your message to Australia? Because at the moment there are more than 60 women and children, um, relatives of ISIS fighters who are in the Al Hall camp in northern Syria. Um, so far, some have been brought back to Australia, but not many. What would be your message to authorities in Australia? Well, our message is the same to all countries. Uh, this problem is a serious one, and we all have a responsibility uh, to take our citizens back. In the past, the United States has helped facilitate returns uh, to countries of origin. That's true both of fighters as well as women and children. Uh, Kazakhstan in particular has been a, a world leader in taking back hundreds of its citizens, prosecuting the criminals and uh, reintegrating the others. Um, uh, so our offer to other countries that are interested in taking their citizens back is we are prepared to help. Uh, and we hope you'll accept that offer. And have you actually made that offer directly to Australia? Well, I'm not going to get into the private diplomatic conversations for, for reasons I'm sure you can appreciate, but um, we have made offers to all of our coalition partners that we're prepared to help if, uh, if needed. And how does the US do that? Because I know the Australian government has repeatedly said it's far too dangerous to send um, Australian um, foreign service or um, you know government employees into northern Syria to be extracting um, the women and children from the al -Hul. Camp. So how would the U.S. government go about that? Well, the details can be worked out. Um, what we have done in the past is use U.S. military assets uh, to uh, exfiltrate the fighters and families uh, from um, uh, parts of Syria out of Syria where it's easier to, uh, to transfer custody. Uh, there are also a number of non-governmental organizations uh, that are working in northeastern Syria. Um, it might be possible to uh, partner with them. Uh, since they have access to camps and other facilities. There's a number of different options that are on the table, and uh, we're pursuing very much an all-of-the-above approach because regardless of what means we use, the bottom line is we need to get these kids and their parents and the fighters out of Syria and back to countries of origin. So in response to the American offer, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison was asked why they would not accept the United States offer, and I've highlighted it here, asked what reason there could be to reject the offer, given it would guarantee Australian officials would not be placed at risk. Mr Morrison, our Prime Minister, said, I don't engage in hypotheticals on national security issues. So I, I just want to make it clear um, to the audience that really the Australian government has been chasing itself and using misdirection in this issue. There is no reason why the Australian government cannot repatriate the Australian women and children safe for political will, and that's the only thing that stops them from doing so. Um, and it is that political will that has forced us to go public with our with our situation, and um, it's uh, it's it is what forced us into making a more public appearance about the situation um, and, and respects of public advocacy. Um, I want to also share with you um, this predates the United States offer but share with you the Australian ludicrousy of the position that we have, which is what forced me to go into a public and do the Four Corners program to begin with. So um, in July 2019, the Home Affairs Minister, Peter Dutton, said that a temporary exclusion order would be issued against Australian citizens if the Home Affairs believed there is a chance that it could stop a terrorist attack from happening. In that legislation, Mr Dutton said, that 40 fighters had returned and there are still 80 people remaining in those countries. Now, I had already organised the family groups and I was already aware of the numbers at this stage. In order to get 80 remaining in those countries, I knew that the Home Affairs Minister actually said those 80 would have to include the children. Um, to get 80, my own grandchildren would have to be included, the one-year-old. They'd have to be included as a foreign fighter. In the following day, in an interview on the ABC, the radio, the national broadcaster, Minister Dutton, Minister for Home Affairs, refused to answer questions about how many children were in the numbers he'd used. Us not being public allowed the department, the minister, to actually indicate that our children, my grandchildren, were labelled or could have been foreign fighters. And so there it was. My grandchildren and my daughter were all labelled as foreign fighters and possible terrorists in the Australian parliament. And that challenge had gone, and that statement had gone unchallenged, which then forced my hand into making a public statement and trying to advocate for their return. I'm not going to labour the points. Um, I'd like to, to spend a bit of time just in summary. Um, you will have seen the video, we've seen some information that's there, and hopefully I'll get some question and answer from, from the audience. 
But if I could summarise um, uh, the issue, from a human rights perspective, citizens have the right to return home. And my daughter and my grandchildren are citizens and they have the right to return home. Citizens enjoy the protection of their host country, of the, who they're citizens of. And at the moment, Australia is advocating its responsibility as all nations are advocating their responsibilities by leaving them there in, their, in, those, in those conditions. From a humanitarian point of view, the conditions are deplorable. The Kurds are doing the best they can with the resources they have. The whole area is depressed. The whole area is facing a humanitarian crisis. Actually, to help that environment, we need to take back our nationals and allow the Kurds and the Syrians to rebuild and to concentrate on their own people. They shouldn't be having to babysit our, our children. They shouldn't have to be looking after our families. So there's a humanitarian reason for it. There's also a sustainability reason for this. Our key ally, the United States, and the key ally of many Western nations wants them to return home. Our key ally in the fight against IS wants them home. So sooner or later, they should be returning home. Question is, do you want my granddaughter to come back when she's seven, 17 or 27? Do you want my grandson to return when he's five, 15 or 25? Because the only way they're not returning is if they die. And is that really the proposition that we're putting up there? That we'd rather see my children, my grandchildren die than return home. Our call to the government is very, is very straightforward. Treat them as any other Australian you would treat them. If there is something wrong, if you've got a concern about them, treat them as you would any other Australian. Put them under, under control orders by consent. Charge them if need to. Put them in front of the courts. Do what you need to do. Treat these women the way they, they should be treated, but they need to come home to a safe environment. And the Kurds and the Syrians need to get on with rebuilding their lives what they can. So when we say bring them back and treat them as any other Australian, as the other Westerners, our Western countries are very rich countries. Our systems are very sophisticated. If we can't handle the return of 20 women and 40 children or 19 adults or 19 children or 30 children, what chance does, does uh, the other countries have? If we can't lead with our sophistication, with our, with our, with our resources, then what else can other countries do? And lastly, I'd say, Leaving our children, leaving our, 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 our grandchildren in that situation, does that make us, what does that make us to our own values? What do we stand for? What is our liberal democracy? What, are, what have we fought at this, this abhorrent organisation called ISIS? If we haven't fought the ISIS to destroy these, these abhorrent values, we're keeping people over there locked up without charge, keeping children in detention when they should not be in detention. What does that make of us? What does that make of our countries? What, is it, what does it do to families? What does it do to, to my family? What does it do to my grandchildren, to my, to my daughter, to those, my relatives around me? How do we have trust and work with the, with the institutions that are there to support us? So I'd, I'd call on the governments to act today, put them in a safe place, treat them as you would any other national, stop pretending to saying it's dangerous to take them when clearly you can take them. It's only political will that's taking this action and we'd ask them to act today. The conditions that they're in is atrocious and the people that are looking after them have more important things to do to rebuild their lives. For all concerned, we must act today and not tomorrow. I hope I've added to the discussions today and I hope that, uh, that you found it of value and I hope that I can answer your questions as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.